All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Josh. I'm here with Aaron Roizen, our head winemaker. We're here to talk to you about our Pinot Noir program, um, certainly a grape that's grown around the world. Um, I am not sure why we're that crazy that we, uh, we grow it. Actually, I do, but um, not always willing to admit it. Uh, but it is a maddening grape. It is uh, very uh, challenging, and that's probably why we love it, because we love, we love a good challenge, uh, especially when it tastes like this uh, when you're done. So um, our, our Pinot Noir, we've been doing it since the beginning. So we opened in 92 with the 91 uh, Pinot Noir offering. Um, so we've been growing it for quite a while. Um, the original, um, the home vineyard uh, on the Round Rock was planted uh, in the 1980s. Um, so 91 was one of the original uh, uh, vinifications of that fruit anywhere. Um, so uh, we filled that out and added the Maria Feld uh, vineyard uh, right across the road in block 137. Um, so Maria Feld's a Swiss clone, it's a little looser clustered, a little different characteristic. So. Um, good to have some variability in the program. The home vineyards planted mostly to Dijon clones. Um, there are some replants in there uh, now as well. So a um, couple different sites to choose from to make this wine. Um, Pinot in general, just a very thin skin, um, very temperamental uh, beast um, that we have to try to tame every year. Um, it's a lot of work in the vineyard, a lot of hand work. Um, it, it's really uh, intensive, where I would say that most of our viticulture uh, is not, we're not needing to go through and do a lot of cluster thinning and dropping of fruit. Um, the Pinot is harvested usually uh, in three or four um, different sessions um, and a lot of the times hand harvested. So where we've gone with a lot of the other varietals to machine harvesting, um, there's such variability and such nuances um, to the vineyard, um, even within the same vines, that you have to go through and, and do multiple harvests, multiple hand selections um, of the fruit, really to get um, the fruit in uh, the way you want it, um, so we're, we can have different lots to play with to make um, basically just one wine. Um, I really don't know if we would be growing it today uh, if it wasn't so essential for our sparkling program. So um, I would probably attribute to that, that um, the Pinot as much to that as, as I would to our, uh, our love of, of a good fight. Um, so um, Aaron, what are, you, what are your thoughts in, in the vineyard? You get out and walk with me quite often in the Pinot. It seems like if I'm pulling you out to the vineyard, uh, it's, it's usually uh, to taste uh, uh, Pinot Noir and, and always first. That's always the first thing we struggle with. Yeah. So, you know, when we go onto the vineyard, the thing that always strikes me with the fruit at Lamoureux, uh Pinot Noir in particular, is that uh, it's incredibly clean. So the, the, it is a challenge, but the viticultural practices here um, are second to none. So this fruit as challenging as it is to grow is very pristine and it's very healthy and that's the whole thing like the balance and the health of the fruit and the canopy is all there so when we're tasting the berries typically what we're seeing is still pretty taut skin there's maybe a little bit of dimpling that's starting to happen on the berries but we're always leaning towards uh with a for an acid driven style so that riper jammy characteristic doesn't necessarily translate in the finger lakes it kind of gets lost in the whole mix of things so when we're picking it based on the flavors that we're tasting with those bright cherry that raspberry with the maria feld in particular there's all kinds of spice that is not present in other pinot noir clones and that's one of the big things that makes uh, the flavors at lamro's pinot re really unique and because Maria Feld is not a very common clone, um, is this spice that we get from that. So that's that's a lot of things that we're looking for when we're tasting on the grapes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So that variability, I think, is what, what makes this wine, having those two vineyards to blend. Um, Maria Feld, um, because it's looser clustered, is much less susceptible 
to botrytis, which um, is normally what's, you know, if, if you can make, if you can get your vines through the winter <laughs> here, um, Pinot Noir is, is um, you know, uh, semi cold hardy, but um, very temperamental with wet feet, with your site and where you grow it. Um, so if you can get a good, a good, a good planting, a good vineyard, um, protecting your fruit from botrytis, um, you know, is, is key because that's going to destroy your character. It's going to destroy, uh, your color, uh, eventually in your wine and, um, tr truly just destroy your wine in general. So, um, so that's a, that's a great point with, uh, with the Maria Feld. Um, it's only a half acre, um, but it, it really does, uh, in my mind, make the difference. So, um, so we go out, we bring all this fruit in, um, you know, like I said, three or four pickings of, of that, um, that home vineyard, uh, you know, uh, usually a, a third or fourth lot with the Maria Feld. Um, Aaron talked to us a little bit about, you know, our, our fermentation uh, practices and um, oak regime on the, on the Pinot. So with the uh, Pinot Noir, we again lean towards the fruit expression. So. This is 100% whole berry maceration. So the berries are not crushed at all. The skins and juice remain intact. There are no punch downs at the beginning of fermentation. It's strictly just a pump over. So we want to fix those color compounds, those pigment, those, those co-pigment factors with some proper aeration to the juice. But that also provides a very fruit driven profile so the tannins are have a much slower uptick so we're looking for everything is kind of metered out in a way that we can control the flavor building um, and the complexity so once primary fermentation finishes it's pressed off right before um, it's completely dry so usually around one to two bricks and then it will go into stainless steel for about two weeks to complete malolactic fermentation and then after it's settled down with that um, Part, it's barreled in 100% French oak. Majority of it is uh, relatively neutral, so we're looking at barrels that are between seven to 10 years old. And then depending on the vintage, it's between 20 to 40% newer French oak. So that's, you know, one to four or five years old. And uh, it's really vintage dependent, you know, and we want that oak to just hold all the fruit up. So all the work that we did on the front end with manifesting all the flavors in the wine, we don't want it to be hammered down with uh, oak tan profile. We're trying to find this slow progression, this movement and build uh, more and more layers of the tannin that's already present in the grapes. So it's not that we're using the barrel program as any kind of masking device or any kind of seasoning. It's more to uh, make the fruit flavors and the tannin that we've uh, extracted from the skins more present and and amplified yeah and that, that's a good point with the uh, oak so much like our other reds where we're using neutral vessel um, we're focusing on french oak for this product um, and some of our chardonnay but this is getting a hundred percent french oak so um, you know can you tell us just just a little bit more about the grain structure and you know we're using American oak predominantly for Cab Franc and Merlot um, what is it about French oak that really um, you know makes itself so amenable to Pinot well it's a very curious reaction what happens with Pinot Noir when it goes into American oak so that Quercus alba that grows in this country some strange reaction happens where this dill flavor comes about and it, Pinot Noir is the only variety that seems to have that interaction and exchange. So with the French oak, there's, that's not there. It's not a flavor that comes about. So what we're left with is these really beautiful, lighter notes uh, that lift all the fruit up. So we're not, we're not hitting it with all of these heavy, uh, sweeter oak profiles that like new American oak does. So even the new French oak that we're using is helping uh, lift everything that's already there. So, you know, but it's partially tradition, but for what seems to happen, it's what the wine wants to do. And that's, you know, the whole thing is that we're trying to guide this wine along the path that it wants to be 
sort of driven along and the French oak seems to provide that so yeah absolutely and this this how this wine opens just sitting in the glass here for the last five minutes um, just changes continually uh, evolving uh, and doing the same thing in the bottle over time so um, in that fruit driven style beautiful young um, definitely food friendly always um, you know for many years or decade to come so um, good job my friend <laughs>